today we're going to continue our talk as we go through Mental Health Awareness Month. And as we talk today, we're going to look at what we can do at this time, at this moment, at this place to be better advocates for mental health. So today we're going to have a talk with Miss Ashley Aran Malate, a psychiatric nurse practitioner who's going to share her views on mental health. We're going to talk a little bit about depression, anxiety, cultural and gender issues. And most importantly, what we can do to become better mental health advocates, not only for ourselves, but for our friends, for our family, and for our community. Welcome to our continual talk about mental health and mental health awareness. And so today, as we continue this discussion on depression and anxiety, We're going to move into part two of this conversation. And today we have a dynamic presenter with us, Ms. Ashley Aran Malate, who is going to give this excellent presentation to us. Uh, A little bit about her. Uh, She is a recent grad of Duke University. She is a proud HBCU alum of the great Tuskegee University, Um, also a graduate of the university. Uh, of Ohio University. She is an author. Uh, She has done a lot of articles on mental health, and currently she is a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. And so today we're going to take a little bit of time to sit back and listen to this professional talk to us a little bit about how mental health is so important, the signs and things to look at, and when it comes to depression, anxiety, and what can we do to continue to better ourselves? So without further introduction, I want to present to you Miss Ashley Aran Malate. Ashley, thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, having this little chat with us today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure to be with you today. I actually even, I canceled a date just to be able to talk to you today. <laughs> Oh, I did. I rescheduled a date at Texas and said, let's do tomorrow for a guy. Lucky guy, same difference. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so glad to be here. Um, mental health is something that I'm super passionate about um, for all people, um, all the time, not just sometimes. And it, it just brings me great joy to be able to share more about it with you today. Awesome. So Ashley, I know that earlier we were talking about you know, different things. And I think you got a lot of those questions that were kind of populated before time. So I'm just going to let you talk a little bit. And then uh, when we get to a certain point, I'll jump back in. Sure. Well, I, 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 as we know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, which I love that we get a month to talk about it. I mean, we even have May, you know, Mental Illness Week, Mental Health Awareness Week. But I, I feel that so much of information that we're getting is either not quite correct or not well delivered. Um, I mean, even for example, a lot of people don't even know last week was National Police Week, you know? So there are so many things that we know that are generally existing in in society, information, but it's not accessible to all people. And I personally have this mission to just help make it more accessible. Um, in an equal way where people who are of great poverty uh, or great wealth can still have quality care. Um, It seems like, even in my experience, my anecdotal experience, and even my professional training, that we, society, normalize or have come to normalize suffering um, in relationships or in uh, you know, personal relationships at work or even for our own body and mental health where we just think it's normal to have to go to the doctor so often or it's so normal to have great stress and chaos that um, it kind of rewrites how we're supposed to be functioning truly in harmony. So you know, in this role of me practicing psychiatry, I stand here as a, someone who can diagnose and prescribe but I also look at what else can you do besides diagnose and prescribe people when we when not everyone has the same means to treat themselves in a sustainable way. 
So I love talking about what other things can be done. What are the real needs of people so that we can just help people get better and suffer less in a, in a long-term way and then pass that on to other people. So when we talked, um, we, we are having this talk and we're looking at depression, but from you as a professional, what is that, that clinical, you know, definition of, of depression? That's a great question when you say clinical, because clinical depression is when that heaviness is beyond sadness. It is when you're experiencing something that feels so down, it's, it's getting in the way of how you function every day. Um, and a lot of times when we look at it in the clinical setting, it's, it's in the way of how you function in the family or in your role, role at work, or are you feeling worthless? Um, some people feel really guilty and ashamed and don't know why. Um, they lose pleasure in things that they normally enjoy doing. They may um, change the way they're eating or sleeping. And those type of symptoms go on for at least two weeks, typically, we look at it. Um, there's a lot of different scales that primary care doctors even use. But unfortunately, um, sometimes it's common for primary care doctors to miss depression, either when it does show up or even when someone is trying to get help for depression. It's, it's easily missed in certain environments. So having that awareness of what it could feel like from a clinical perspective and non-clinical perspective of those early signs is very helpful. But there are also non-traditional symptoms. And these are the ones that are just even more interesting to me. This was a 2014 article that I referenced. And it said even in black adults, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, could be a non-traditional sign of depression. Hmm. Um, being irritable. Some people are just irritable and edgy, um, keyed up a lot, angry, um, overworking themselves, being hypersexual or um, using substances or having a hard time making decisions can show up and actually be their way, like their body's way of expressing depression. So I look for those things too. I mean, I don't, I'm not a by the book kind of person per se. Um, there's really, like, I think all mental health especially is, is a gray area. So there's a lot to consider when we're feeling about looking for depression truly. Now, one thing that you uh, mentioned was gender. How do men and women you know, when we look at depression, how do we, how are those gender roles defined when it comes to the manifestation, you know, of depression? What, what do you see more? I see it more in women. Um, it's probably a many that say if there were 16 people, you know, one in 16 men would truly have clinical depression and one in eight women would have it. Women, we see it um, oftentimes like postpartum, um, and that's, that's a, a sensitive topic in and of itself because uh, it's supposed to be a quote unquote happy time, but why is mom complaining of quote unquote feeling sad? Um, there's a lot of changes in society with the expectations of women in terms of work performance and keeping up a household. Um, it's, it's truly hard to say what quote unquote causes depression because there's so many factors, environmental factors, there's societal factors and definitely genetic Genetics plays a huge role in a lot of how diseases or diseases, however you want to perceive that as, how they show up. Um, and men, um, like I went just going by just anger or irritability or just sometimes men just numb out um, and just kind of just cut off from their feelings. And that that's their, their way of being depressed. And, but I think it's important to, to, to know and for your listeners to know that People who look really happy and jovial and joking either at work or at school and in social settings, they could be depressed as well. Um, so depression doesn't really have a real face. So I want people to really just be more open and aware to just what is not, you know, textbook descriptions and definitions of things. So that also then leads to when we look at signs and symptoms some of those things that you have described to us mm -hmm. but why is it that some people who are afflicted by depression look at suicide as an answer to their problem you know that's a challenging one suicide is one of those it's a tragedy but it's also a symptom 
of something serious. And I like to think about it as like a root cause type of thing and reframing how we even say someone committed suicide. What if we said instead to say someone died by suicide? Because then it kind of takes the, maybe like a negative blame off of them, off of the person who did feel like that might've been their only way of dealing with their feelings. Um, with true depression, because there's a difference between feeling depressed and being depressed, but true depression has a sort of weight that a lot of people have a hard time even describing in words, but it's a, you feel it all over your body and it's an extreme emotional pain. A lot of times suicide is a response to ending that emotional pain. And it's not an easy response. Um, in talking to people who have survived their attempts, it's not something that they're doing to be selfish or um, get attention. Often it's just they needed the pain to stop or they felt too ashamed to tell someone and get help, but they didn't wanna be a burden to anyone else. Um, and unfortunately, uh, suicide or choosing suicidal um, or self-harm behaviors was their, their final resort of ending their suffering emotionally. And so when we see these types of signals, you know, what can we do? What type of intervention, you know, is there in, for us to recognize that someone's in trouble? I, I am all about just trying to, one, self-care. And it's easy to say, oh, just check on, check on, do this, do that. But I think personally investing in self and doing self-care Keith, I have a whole spiel on self-care and presentations because it fills me up inside to know that it's not selfish to want to say no to someone or something if you just don't feel like it or, or knowing that you have enough energy preserved inside to function throughout the day, not just here and there throughout the day, but truly throughout the whole day and find things that add value to your life. Taking good care of self is actually really challenging. Um, I heard a really good um, psychiatrist, so I like psychoanalysis, and I have, there's a whole specialty in just studying curiosity, and I'm, I'm one of those nerds that love to study curiosity, um, and he said, he said, being mentally, um, dis, uh, having a mental illness is not easy, but also being mentally healthy is not easy. If you really think about it, both require some level of effort right? You, no one's choosing to be depressed, but you have to choose to be really healthy mentally. It requires effort. Even me personally, as a quote-unquote expert, I have to practice what I preach. Otherwise, I know what to expect. And taking good care of self is not just going to bed on time, going, you know, exercising. It's just knowing when to pause, being present, being mindful of what you eat and what you expose yourself to. Um, and I, I will shorten that to say self-care is extremely important to do first. But checking in on your others in your circle is, is crucial. Um, yes, we're still in this, this, you know, this unique pandemic phase where that still makes it kind of challenging. But there's a mental health foundation that created this acronym called NICE. And I like that it it's just simplifies what you can do. Check in on someone. Um, you can offer assistance. If someone that you know or notices in your group or, or circle is kind of faded out, are they edgy? Has their personality changed? Um, are they isolating? Are they sleeping differently and eating differently? Check in on them. Like, try to have a safe way to talk to someone with and show compassion to them. Um, it does seem kind of funny, haha, to say, you know, you need therapy. But it, that's weaponizing help. And I'll just be real. Like, don't tell anybody to get help. Like, oh, you need therapy, please. Um, or, but if, find a way to say that in a way that someone receives it in a safe way to say, hey, I've noticed, you know, something's going on with you. Is it okay if we can just talk? Um, if that doesn't work, then offer some type of solution to, to that person to say, um, I know this seems challenging for you. Encourage them. Offer re real resources. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's not easy for someone to just get a, a therapy session, an appointment, but especially nowadays when you have to wait a little bit longer to get in, I mean, <laughs> not, not everyone's that patient to even want to say, okay, I'll get help, but I know I have to wait six weeks for an appointment. 
um, be willing to sit by somebody and just sit quietly with them. You don't have to talk. Just your presence could help someone just really figure out what's going on with them. Um, and then offer resources. There are a lot of help um, helplines online. Um, there are what's called warm lines, which are what are for people who have maybe specific substance abuse type um, concerns. And that person on the other line who has that same lived experience with whatever um, addiction can help walk you through that. And I love that those resources are available. Um, NAMI, NAMI.org is very valuable as well. So um, talking about it first normalizes it for sure. And so when we look at that and we open up that window for talking, I'm going to think about something that we discussed even earlier this afternoon. Okay. When we talked about depression and anxiety, you know, how do those things tie in? Can I be anxious and yet be depressed? Are they two totally separate, you know, mutually exclusive, you know, type of, uh, of mental emotions? Yeah, you know, there is definitely overlap. And it sounds funny when you ask it, like, how am I sad and feeling anxious? This is, that sounds, you know, weird or however you want to term that. But it's, it's very common for both to overlap, for both to coexist. Um, even um, sometimes people who might feel anxious or have an anxiety attack might feel depressed afterwards because it drained them. Or they might feel guilty for having like, man, I should have been able to cope better with that situation and I'm disappointed with myself. So now I feel down about it. Um, and you know, earlier when we're talking about what could be clinical and what's non-clinical, anxiety is very similar as well that, you know, it's, it's okay to feel anxious sometimes. I will just like, just normalize that right now. We need a little bit of you know, boost to just juice us up, whether it's a new job promotion or you're getting ready to go somewhere new and exciting. Yeah, you, I mean, a little anxious is okay. It's, a, it's okay to feel nervous sometimes. But if it's getting in the way of you making decisions or being fearful of going places or doing things um, or making, it, it, it can over override your life. And, and that's when we start looking at, that's an anxiety disorder. Um, and there's, there's a few of those. There's, there's social anxiety disorder where people might feel, you know, they don't want to go places because someone might be already judging them or um, generalized anxiety disorder is, is one of the most common forms. And that's just a general sense of edginess, worrisome. Some people like they, they complain of stomach pains um, because they feel nervous inside in their stomach a lot. But for sure, depression, and anxiety can go hand in hand. The good news is both are very treatable, um, but looking at what causes the most um, disability is depression, and depression is still the leading cause of disability in the world. Um, but anxiety, and for sure, is super treatable, even just with just medication or talk therapy. Well, and let me segue to this question. We know that this is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we're talking about you know a lot of different things. But I want to focus in on where we are right now, this day in May 2022, middle of waves of pandemic, healing, death, sickness, shortages. How is this driving, you know, that depression or how does it drive even anxiety, you know, among a population, even where you live or even in general? You know, how was it driving us? We don't, we humans don't like uncertainty. You know, I like to feel that, okay, if I open the door, I know there's not going to be a dog that's going to meet me and run in my house. Like that we like to know that there's certainty behind every door we open. There's certainty when someone says the end there. And then that extended prolonged uncertainty can mess with you. On top of that, we're adding unfortunately, like layers of tragedy in that. It's not just a, you know, everyone's just getting a rash and, and then we get annoyed and we itch, scratch and we go away. Like where people are suffering on top physically, mentally, emotionally, including suffering of the healthcare providers caring for people, we are collapsing under a huge weight of already undertreated mental issues. Um, so now you've got providers who, you know, doctors, nurses, uh, physician assistants experiencing burnout 
People are leaving the forest. They don't want to go to work. So many people are stressed and overwhelmed. I'm not sure what the solution is, but I think we can't stop talking about it. And if we do keep talking about it, there's got to be a way to talk about it in a way where it makes more sense to people. And I'm not saying that, you know, before or now what we're doing before, but this day in May, like you said, this day in May, we've got to keep talking about it way where it makes sense. Let me give you an example. Recently, I had a patient um, in the clinic. He was new to me, but he wasn't new to the practice. So I, I generally, I am very, very thorough. I, will, I don't like to brag, but that's one thing I'm proud of. I, I like to be very thorough in my work. And I was explaining to him, he was just there for a refill, but I was like, I'm gonna just, you know, maximize this visit. So I was explaining to him his medication, how it helped with his, his condition. Um, I think it was maybe bipolar, schizophrenia. And every, you know, within that five minute conversation, I said, does that make sense? And then I'll keep talking, you know, with first ones, does that make sense? My, my third, does that make sense? He said, you know what? I don't like you asking me that question. <laughs> And I'm like, he said, because, because you're, if you're a psychiatrist or you should know if it makes sense or not, I'm the one with the problems. So why are you asking me if that makes sense? I said, well, sir, I would be doing my job, but I wouldn't be doing it well if what I was explaining to you, what you're taking, didn't make sense. And you walked out here with just a refill and some instructions and you're an autopilot until I see you in 30 days again. So mm -hmm. I need to understand that you understand what I'm saying, because what if I decided to move um, and leave? Like, would you be able to tell, explain to your next provider what's going on with you and how can you advocate for yourself? That's, that's the kind of expectations I have for myself and for people. Like I need to, you to know what's going on with you so you can advocate for yourself. And I'm so passionate about people being able to do that and passing it forward. Like just keep those conversations going. If it doesn't make sense to someone, find a way to make it make, it make sense. Like the young people say, make it make sense. <laughs> Otherwise we're doing ourselves a disservice. Like we're spinning a wheel and we're still seeing increased healthcare costs. We're still seeing more substance abuse. We're still seeing overdoses. We're still seeing people having, you know, dysfunctional family dynamics because it's inconsistent. And there's these health equity issues and access issues that are not getting better despite year after year we go into. And you mentioned something very important earlier where you talked about, you know, that, that self-time. Even on this day, again. This day in May. This day in May, in the year of 2022, with everything that we see, what are a few things that we can do to rest our minds, give calm to our spirits, even though we're riding out these storms? What can we do to help with our own mental health, you know, right now, in this day, at this moment? In this moment, I practice mindfulness. It sounds a little hippy-dippy, but it's, it's kind of free too, because you don't have to go out and look for it or download an app unless you want mm -hmm. to. But my jam is to just dedicate at least 20 minutes of your day in stillness when possible with not trying to process thoughts, not thinking, I mean, truly trying to just still your mind and allow yourself to feel whatever needs to be felt. Even if it's like, it could be, you know, you're content or, if there's grief, and that's something that this also the pandemic has brought on, mm -hmm. that grief is different from depression. Even though you can feel depressed and grief, they're very different and we treat them and see them differently. But feeling what needs to be felt so your body can just know that it's still safe and not in a rushed mode. Um, sometimes self-care can just be, I'm not going to get on social media today and that's going to be it. Or, you know, listening to your favorite song, even though you know it's you're, you're busy and there you get so much. What are those things that you know that you love that feed you inside? Um, is it texting somebody to make them laugh or um, 
making up your bed. I mean, I, I think of like, I'm all about what's not traditional, but cool and works and is efficient because I, I don't want to just give you a list of all the things that we just keep talking about over and over again that are so common of just, oh, you should just know how to um, shower every day. Like, why, why, why not do that? Or what about giving someone a hug that you just, oh yeah, you just get so busy and, and content and busy in life that you just like, oh, I just forget. Let me just love on somebody or enjoy a favorite meal or slow down. Don't watch TV when you drink coffee. Just, just enjoy the coffee. <laughs> you know, I mean, those little things that give you pleasure. Um, breathing, breath work. Have you tried breath work before? I have not. You breathe and you slowly hold it and then slowly let it out especially before bedtime, it is so nourishing to your body. I teach it to everybody who will listen to me talk. It's, it's really wonderful. I mean, I, I do breath work. I mean, three big deep breaths. When you wake up in the morning, before you get in the car, before we have a big meeting, but especially before you go to bed, it just lets your body know like you're safe and it really slows your heart rate down. And it's very nourishing. There's science behind it, but we won't. I won't do that today. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a really wonderful thing. I mean, there's so many wonderful, simple things that we can do because I think we're so used to um, new version of this, a new version of that. Man, I'm all about simple life. Does it? Is it effective? Is it safe? And can it work for you? But also knowing that if those little things don't work, then there are other options. Like yeah, sometimes you need medication, but sometimes you just need a shower and some essential oils of lavender and you're good. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so let me, so let me exit and I'll let you out with this last question. Okay. So as this month goes, this month is going to leave us and we turn our attention to the next big thing. And we leave this in our little compartment until next year. Mm -hmm. But we know that Mental health is an everyday crisis. It's an everyday phenomenon that we go through. So what do we need to do on this day, at this moment, for everyone who is listening? How do we help them become better advocates for mental health, even as we cycle into June, in July, in August, and further on down the road? until we reach this point again next year? I would say everyone who is within the sound of my voice to know, including myself, we are not immune to any mental health crisis. I'm not immune to suicide. You're not, no one's immune. And I, I tell my patients that like, there's no difference. We're not that different. I mean, despite you hearing voices or whoever, what someone might be telling me, I'm not that different. It's just that you had a different upbringing than I did, and I have a different coping set of skills. But man, under any circumstance, we'd be hard pressed. Would how would you feel if someone, you know, if you were homeless, would you really be thinking that you're immune to substance abuse and being um, savagery if you feel to live on the streets? So. I just want to, people to accept that we're all human, we're all vulnerable to certain things and knowing what those vulnerabilities are, even if it's you know just knowing your own uh, family's mental health history, but having compassion for others is crucial, but also having self-compassion for yourself is one of the most beautiful gifts you can give to yourself. And I think those things can be one of the most transformative things as we go forward every day and remembering our why, like, why am I talking about mental health? Why am I um, asking a friend about this or looking this up online about this particular disorder? Am I trying to get better? And remembering your why should be your fuel every day just to bring more awareness and normalizing this because it should be treated like any other part of our health. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Ashley, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to talk a little bit about this side of mental health for us today. And I hope that for those that are listening, that if you are, you know, experiencing, you know, any type of issue that we've talked about to seek help, you know, and 
I'll give some information on um, that mental health hotline um, that you can call um, that is available 24 uh, seven if you need that assistance. And so thank you for having this little talk, you know, with us today to share, you know, the knowledge and the experience that you have about mental health and helping us to not just recognize symptoms and, and get treatment, but also how do we become better advocates for mental health in our community. So I thank you for, for taking a little bit of time out of your day to have a talk with us. Thanks, Keith. Thank you all for listening to this presentation. I'd like to thank Ms. Ashley Aramalate for taking time out of her day and out of her schedule to spend a little time to talk to us about this important mental health issue. And so as we close, I always want to end with this uh, plea that if you or anyone you know is suffering from a mental health crisis and they need assistance, if they're overwhelmed and they need someone to reach out to, please call the National Mental Health Hotline. It is free, it's confidential. It is available 24 seven. That number is 866-903-3787. A brief conversation is sometimes all it takes. So that number, that line, someone is there to help you along the way. So as we end this presentation, thank you for listening and thank you. And I hope that this will inspire you to become better and stronger mental health advocates.